house and I came across some negatives that uh, Arthur Jones had given me many decades ago. And so I went through, so you're going to see tonight some pictures that have never been shown before of the construction of the telescope. There's some sad news is that Bruce Jones also made a movie of the construction of the observatory and the telescope. And uh, I think author, he loaned it out to somebody in Connecticut and we never got it back. So uh, that's the way that goes. If it hasn't been for this guy, this is Llewellyn Evans. He was my great mentor and I showed, I met him when he was 70 years old. So he was a young guy just like me. Of course, I was only 14. And uh, if it hadn't been for him, they wouldn't be an observatory. I don't think, anyway. Because he met Clarence Jones at a uh, engineering meeting in Cincinnati, Ohio. And Llewellyn Evans did a presentation of construction of his 8-inch telescope that he did out in Olympia, Washington. And believe it or not, he used to carry that thing up on the glaciers uh, along with a buddy of his. And I've seen, I saw his telescope, but that sucker was heavy. But anyway, uh, he did this demonstration on how to uh, grind and polish a mirror and, and install it in a telescope. And this turned Clarence Jones on. So when he came home, he went nuts. <laughs> He, I'm sure he had uh, he had four sons, and I'm sure he put them all to get to work building telescopes. And the telescope you see Clarence Jones looking through, the one that's nearest. The other one is, of course, Arthur Jones in the, looking in that. He says six inch telescope, but I think it's an eight inch telescope or something like that. But anyway, Clarence Jones is looking through a twelve inch. Thing about a 12 inch telescope was that Clarence Jones became sort of an evangelist of telescope makers around this area. And he went all through Alabama and everywhere. And they started a sort of a club that became national. And they called it the 12 inch club. And they started building 12 inch telescopes. Now, these mirrors are, are Pyrex, and that's a hard glass. And boy, you really have to work hard to grind that. But uh, anyway. It went national through Scientific American and to building 12-inch telescopes. This telescope wound up in donation uh, from Clarence Jones. He donated it to the, along with his Roloff Roof Observatory, to Macaulay School. And I got to play around with that, but uh, the recent checking on, they tore down the observatory and they don't know what happened to the telescope. They put a building there in its place. So uh, that's the way thing goes. And uh, here's an aerial view. I don't know how Bruce got up there, but uh, drone. <laughs> this was soon after the uh, building was finished in 1936, and of course they had no telescope. And then the Astronomical Society started meeting there, and uh, so. You recognize the landscape. You can see the part of the Brainerd Junior High School there on the left in the upper corner. And mm -hmm. you see all those. There's not very many folks buried in the cemetery there behind us. <laughs> they got the driveway running through. And there's also another building of, of, in the upper left-hand corner up there that was built. And it was the Brainerd recreation center i used to go down there and play chess before we opened the observatory on friday nights so there's a as you can see it's a 21 inch blank a pyrex that uh, clarence jones and bruce went up to uh who is that corn and glass works and they purchased this this blank, and uh, as you can see, it's 20 and a, 21 and a half inches 
in diameter and about four and a half inches in thickness. And I've had the mirror out of the 20 inch and I've t it weighs 125 pounds and they must have ground off, you know, a good five or 10 pounds of glass off that blank there. Ah, I got my slides out of order. Anyway, they constructed a uh, grinding machine. It was down there in the basement. They also had a drill press, a crane, as you can see. And by the way, that's the the door that going to the outside down in the basement that you see there. And you can see some they have some gears that they have mounted on the wall over there. They change to change some speeds of the drill press and motors and stuff. But you can see they had a crane to lift up the uh, the mirror blank off the grinding machine. Like I said, it weighed 125 pounds. And here you see Arthur, Arthur Jones, along with, I forgot the name of the young fellow that's with him, but they both had a, uh, a got credit at UT Knoxville uh, in their engineering course or something, and they did a paper on uh, grinding and polishing the 20-inch mirror. And so... Uh, Author got some sort of little stipends or something about doing this and credit for it. You can see the drill press in the background. And uh, that stayed out of here for a while until they got a new director at the observatory. And he said, we didn't need any of this technical stuff out here. And all the equipment was removed and taken to the engineering department down at UC, University of Chattanooga. And... Here's uh, here's author. He's the mirror is up facing up, and he's using what they call a sub diameter tool to grind and polish on the on the mirror. You can see their grinding machine. That machine wound up being loaned out to somebody in Cokeville. It also never returned. Here you can see uh, one of them there. They're putting, uh, this is, believe it or not, this, this is tar or asphalt. They're, they're putting little squares on a plaster Paris tool. Yeah, but it's, it's tar. Petroleum product, as you can see, it says Texaco on that can there. Uh, you can use anything. It'll get hard or, you know, go from the soft or whatever it is to do the polishing. They, uh, of course, the way they made that Pyrex, I mean, the uh, Plaster of Paris tool was that, that they built a sort of a dam around the 20 inch mirror after the fine grinding and poured Plaster of Paris on top of the mirror. Now you, I don't know, I didn't show you. Anyway, you can see the little hot plate on the bench back there where they're uh, heating it up and then they sort of sticks to the the plaster of Paris too. If you notice something, there's another mirror blank sitting in the background on the bench, and it's polished. They, Clarence Jones bought two blanks, and they ground and polished both of them. The uh, other blank was made for testing the tw the one for the telescope. Uh, it's kind of difficult to make a Cassegrainian telescope with having another mirror to test it out first. And so that was there. It disappeared out of the basement. There's a 20 inch blank running around in Chattanooga somewhere or something. <laughs> and after they get through polishing it, uh, this of course says a 12 inch down there and it's showing it at the 95 percent zone but you go for the using a folk alt tester is look at the uh, you can take a knife edge to cut the the focus of the mirror and you can this one is actually coming the knife edge is cutting the beam from the right so that's the reason you have a shadow on the left 
It's reversed, of course. And as you move the knife edge in and out, you can check the focal length of each one of those little shadowed areas. And that way you can get a statistics as to what kind of curve you have on the mirror itself. As you see down there, it says the uh, radius square over R. There's another formula to that. Here the telescope was actually, uh, after all the castings and everything were done, the Eureka Foundries, uh, that's Clarence Jones and Arthur Jones down there pretending to play with it, I think. Uh, Mr. Delaney, who owned the uh, Eureka Foundries, he told me that Clarence Jones was like a Zagum uh, father of a newborn baby. You know, he was he was worried about it because when you cast cast iron, if you have any moisture anywhere near it, the, the thing will explode. And so you have to start all over again, plus it's dangerous. And so Jones was kind of frightened about that. There we go. And you wonder how they got the uh, mount through the dome? They used a gin pole, we call it. I used a gin pole in the Air Force when we worked with our antennas and stuff. So uh, we had those two to block the radar unit to keep it from blowing away in high winds. <laughs> but you can see they had a human-operated winch down there to lift that... Uh, German, the equatorial mount, the, the right ascension axis and setting circles up onto the roof. And uh, I would assume that they, they moved it to where they could drop it down through the dome slit. An interesting thing about the pedestal, which should must be already installed in, in before this picture was made. And, uh, of course, they had a contractor that did the construction of the of the main pier, which you see in the rotunda out here. And uh, they knew nothing about celestial pose, but they knew about magnetic north. So they aligned it with magnetic north. So when they put the bolts in through the foundation, you know, to set the mount on it, and when you go up and take a look at the mount, you'll see that it's off at an angle from the, from the, pet, the, the concrete pedestal. The, yeah. Author told me they used uh, crowbars. I'm talking about the railroad crowbars, the kind that Gandhi dancers use to move rails. And they danced that sucker over completely assembled. And I don't know how much it weighs, but it's got to be a couple of tons. And they moved that telescope on that concrete. And here was the opening night. <laughs> You know, blame Bruce for taking flash photographs or something. I don't know. And of course, that's Clarence Jones down there. He was doing the directing. It's probably some politicians or something he's talking to there. And if you also notice that we have the telescope upside down compared to what is right there. If you ever go up there and look, the declination circle is on the left in this picture. But if you go upstairs, it's on the right. It'll go either way. <laughs> and we did, uh, shoot, I meant to bring in the, uh, well, I'll do this afterwards. There was a, uh, the basement, after being cleared out, was still being used for uh, telescope making. And uh, so I guess Clarence Jones and the other Jones boys, I, they, and one other member of the Astronomical Society held uh, telescope making classes down in the basement. This is a telescope class that's see, in 1968 that Emil Volchek and I taught, and he's the guy in the blue shirt in the middle there. And the guy that's going like mad there on the left Sam is Sam Delay, our local <laughs> weatherman. And that's and Todd sitting down, isn't it? That, is a, that was the strongest man I ever met in my life. He, he did two 6-inch mirrors and one 12-inch mirror, while the whole time some people were there just doing a 6-inch, as you can see. 
that these other people. And uh, Todd Etten, who squatted down there in a the chair, made the little the boards to sit on top of the uh, barrels. Some of these barrels are titanium, and they were donated to us by the Southern Railroad because we had a member from Southern Railroad. And uh, we took a chisel and knocked holes in the top of it. So, you know, we have what they call wets. You have to keep the mirror wet as a lubricant for the grinding compound and also for polishing. And plus, you, do, you have to clean up after each grit, you know, you start out with a number 80, and then you go down to 120. And you know, if you do any sanding, you know it's the same kind of thing, except this loose grit. Uh, Amos there, he wanted us to get carborundum, which is very hard and never breaks down. But our kits came with aluminum oxide, which is hard, but it breaks down and and it gets smoother and smoother and smoother. And then that, you know you have to throw some more on there to do it. But it's not as disastrous. The carborundum really fractures the glass. So, so uh, this is Todd Etten. He was the president at one time. Emil Volchak was the president. And you can see Todd Etten's daughter with her back to us there. And that's Debbie Etten. And the gentleman, young guy, facing this the other is Chuck McKnight. And Chuck McKnight along with several other members, helped me put in the windows into this building. We swapped those out. If you notice from this right here, you can see they're sort of French windows. They open out. We have sashes in here now, which are made of Lexan. So we had to be doing that for obvious reasons. So uh, we had two classes running at the same time. Uh, so that meant 16 people or more because we had family members like Todd and Debbie. We had a team that was going on some of them. And our secretary treasurer was there, Bill Swafford, and he was another strong guy. Uh, I, I didn't stop him in time. We were supposed to be making the six-inch mirrors at F8, and, he, and I stopped him, and it was F6. <laughs> he was really grinding. <laughs> Uh, and we had a class on Saturday also. I taught all of them and tested all the mirrors when they got done because they just didn't understand the testing. So here's one of the completed telescopes, and it was finished by the gentleman on the left. That is Floyd Cheek. He's about 16 in this picture. And then uh, I, I think I know the guy in the middle. And then Samuel Volchak on the right. We went to Atlanta to see the annular eclipse. And is that you, Bobby? Is that you in the middle, Bobby? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I was young at one time. Well, in 1984, I was, I was getting old. So, uh, interesting thing about Floyd Cheek's telescope. It's it's another one. It's F six. And he still has it. And uh, I guess he's retired now. <laughs> but Todd Etten had some property up on Lookout Mountain near Cloudland Canyon on the rest. They call it Sunset Drive. And where they used to be an old honky tonk. <laughs> and yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we used to have parties up there, everything. Ralph, did you ever go to that? You were there, weren't you? Yes. Are you with us? Yes. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah. Bobby, that can't be 1984. When we went to, on, uh, you, you were? Yeah, really? Yeah, we had a ball. That's the first place I saw. Early 80s, 81, 82. Yes. Yes. Anyway, we had a we had a guy show up in a Cadillac with a Questar telescope. That's a little three and a half inch telescope. It's really precision he made, supposedly, I guess it was a beautiful work of art and it cost over two thousand bucks. So he he was sort of showing it off to us. He set it up on the hood of his car and 
pointed at Saturn. Of course, we all love to look at Saturn, you know. He had this little three-inch telescope looking at Saturn. So I said, well, that looked nice. I said, well, let's come over and look at this guy's $50 telescope. I don't, it, I guess Floyd had a lot less than 50 bucks in that thing. And take a look in there. Look at Saturn. The guy uh, looked at Saturn and went to his car, packed up his little telescope, and left. <laughs> because <laughs> a six-inch telescope compared to three inches. <laughs> Don't care how much it paid, paid for it. The definition is a heck of a lot different. And that's the end of the slides. We we need a uh, I need to put a camera on the, here so you can see the rest of it. I wanted to do a live presentation. How will we do that? I need to share my camera. Um, stop. So click share. Stop sharing screen. There you go. And now click camera and choose a camera you want to use. And it looks like your your EOS camera is not turned on. Is there power should, on your camera? It shouldn't be. You need to turn on your... There you go. <laughs> now it works. Uh, now I have to figure out how I'm going to uh, get over here. Hmm. Okay. Except I'm in our way. I don't need that anymore. Uh, here's a homemade six inch. I bought this off eBay for about 50 bucks. That's amazing because they sell well over a hundred and it came with a homemade mirror cell. Wow. It's aluminized. Yes. Now, When we taught, had the telescope making class, Edmund Scientific sold another book like this. That's backward to me. I don't know what that's <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this was by Mr. Brown. Everybody, uh, Edmund, what is this? Oh, I need to click on this. Everybody uh, in the telescope making class bought one of these. And it showed you how to do everything, even building the Foucault tester underneath my hand here. And we had one of those. We had a regular lab, you know, set up down in the basement. And uh, we had a testing tunnel because you have air currents that go across. And God, I forget what, how, what they call it, where you can see a candle burn, you know, and you can see the flame. Yeah, well, you do the same thing with a Foucault tester, and you can see all the wind, you know, the air currents going around the mirror. So we had a, Todd Etten built us a testing tunnel that, that was about, uh, hmm, it was nearly the length of the basement. And uh, so we could set up uh, mirrors in there and test them as we we're going along grinding and polishing. That was a lot of fun, believe it or not. And like I said in the newsletter or whatever, if you read, uh, about 40 mirrors we had. How many of them turned into telescopes? I have no idea. Uh, Amo Volchek, one of the things you have to know is uh, what the curvature while you're grinding. When I ground my first telescope mirror, I had what it was called a template. And what I did, I took a stick or two before or something and scribed a piece of metal with the radius of curvature of the telescope. You know, if you're going to have a 50 inch focal length, you have a radius of curvature of 100 inches. So then you cut it out. And of course, like that's how you test it. But Name of Volchek came up with this, we call, which is a spherometer. And uh, you're probably going to die if I set it on top of this. But 
I just so happen to have a mirror blank that has a curve in it. Anybody want to guess what it is? I'm, I know you can't see this. I'm going to uh, zero this where you can see maybe. See? Yeah. This will get, this actually gives you the focal length. I've already cal calibrated. In other words, I set it on a flat surface and made it zero. And I just take gently go around until I feel resistance. And it says the focal length is about 51 inches. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> If you have a, I got a four inch mirror blank off eBay, another good deal. <laughs> and uh, since it wasn't, the guy didn't think it was parabolized, so he sent me a temp, a, uh, a mold to make a polishing lap to polish out that four inch mirror. And uh, this is one of the things you could get from Edmund. They'll send you a little temp, uh, mold that you put on top of your mirror and it had squares in it. Believe it or not, you didn't want to center the thing. It would cause zones in the in the mirror. So you wanted to uh, set those and pour your pitch. We use pitch, not pine tar. And since we don't have smell vision you can't smell what I've got here in the boxes. <laughs> uh, but you come up with this to polish with. This is called burgundy pitch. Smells like motor oil to me. <laughs> so uh, you set the, uh, you have your barrel and your bench or whatever it is. Mr. Evans helped me with my mirror and he said, he had a, a box it, it used to be mail had nails in it as he saw it we get a nail barrel but they didn't make those in my day so he had a box that, that nails came in you know it was a wooden box it was just the right height to me to sit down and uh, with it open i could turn that box around with my feet sort of like a someone doing a uh, potter's wheel and the tool was sitting on it, and I sit and stroke this back and forth like this, and we do what they call a W stroke. But one of the things that happens is when you have two pieces of glass like this, as it comes over, it leans over, you know, and it grinds more off the edge and of the tool and more off the center of the mirror. That's pretty good. It's kind of blurry, but, you know, you can see way back there, can't you? <laughs> we have another guest in here. Are you a member? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, one thing's about when you have a large group, you know, doing something, you can buy stuff cheaper in quantities. And so we used a Edmund Scientific again, and they had mirror kits. How much you think it, it came with two Pyrex chunks of glass like this? And uh, what we did, they also sold plate glass tools. So we bought their kits. So we wound up with, and of course they sent out an ample supply of grinding compounds. So we wound up really with two kits. So we shared, and we didn't want anybody to, you know. This is a 1993 catalog, and I'm not going to be able to show that to you, I don't think. But anyway, the price of a kit in here for a six-inch blank and everything with it is That's right, $13.95. I don't know what, you know, of course, you know what it is. Everybody thinks it's $13 instead of actually $14. Anyway, anyway. Uh, 
Also, there was another company in business at that time, Jaegers. And Edmund and Jaegers both, they sold surplus lenses from World War II. And uh, I've made a lot of money selling those things these days at star parties that I bought early in my days. Ah. Uh, Yeah, I still make the same damn money I've made when I retired from IBM, and I've had three jobs since. Uh, you ever wonder why uh, we have an inch and a quarter eyepieces? Well, Russell Quarter, I guess, the father of amateur telescope making in the United States. I don't know where any of you know what this is, but this is a uh, usually a bathroom sink uh, plumbing fixture. <laughs> Huh? No. <laughs> it came off of a bathroom sink, which are inch and a quarter in diameter. Most of it. Now I guess some people put in an inch and a half or so. With, so that's usually a kitchen sink. So that's not two inches. So we don't have. I don't know where the two inches came from. So that's how we got focusers and eyepiece. You know, you just cut this off, you know, you got an inch and a quarter eyepiece barrel right there. This is where you can slide it in. <laughs> so you put it, you make it slide up through another tube and you got a focuser. So there's your, there's your telescope part. We can't do anything without books. And the 20 inch telescope upstairs was made from this book. Amateur telescope making. The editor was Mr. Ingalls. And uh, believe it or not, he was still alive when I was kicking around. <laughs> and uh, Scientific American back in the good old days was a really good uh, magazine for amateurs. They had a page they called Amateur Scientists. And so they promoted telescope making. And this book is a cond cond condensation, <laughs> condensed version of all those magazine articles. And there are three volumes, book one, book two, and book three. And of course, book three is very advanced. It gets into Smith telescopes and stuff like that. So, uh, You can still buy them. Uh, Williams uh, Printing. But I heard something. They just went out of business. Is that Ralph? Right, Ralph? Yes, but the the American astronaut. Yeah, Williams uh, Printing Company up, up in Virginia. They, I guess they just went out of business. They're back Nobody in reads business. books anymore. And this was, also, this was a French guy that a lot of people followed his books, too. And this was the 1950s. And this is a uh, translation version, and it's from the uh, Natural History Library. Oh, we can't forget my relative. Making Your Own Telescope by Alan J. Thompson. He not only told you how to grind and polish your mirrors, but he also told you how to make the mounts, which you saw out of the plumbing materials. And he made them very precise by pouring Babbitt bearings in them. You you had the threads cut off the pipe, and then you filled up, you know, you had to center the pipe inside the T-pipe, T and then you pour in huh, Babbitt, just like you're using a, in a... <laughs> yeah, and a bearing in, for a, uh, what do they got? Piston rods. Yep, on the crankshaft. Gee whiz. <laughs> you guys probably didn't hear all what he just said. <laughs> well, any questions? This is about all I got to say. I have nothing on how to cast telescope mounts. So. <laughs> Bobby, the tar that you mentioned 
Uh, What's that? The tar that you mentioned turning the the mirror with. Um, are those little squares affixed to that blank and then yes. polished on there? How yes. how how do you get the parabolic figure with those with just that? Oh wow. <laughs> Uh, believe it or not, you know, you, if you take a little pressure point, you know, I, I understand a phonograph needle pressing on a vinyl of a, uh, record player produces something like 25,000 pounds per square inch. And when you're using that mirror on top of it for that, uh, pitch or tar or whatever it is you're using, it produces enough friction. It heats up and uh, actually melts the glass. And not only planes, that you use what we call uh, ferric oxide, you know, called Jewelers Rouge for polishing. You don't want to really use that. They got better polishing material now, but back in my day, you know, I don't want my mom thought with everything turning red in the house, but, you know. <laughs> and uh, I meant to bring up the we still have the crane and the polishing lap down in the basement. Uh, I don't think what time you don't want to wait for me to go down and get that thing and bring it. Besides, I'd get that. It's still covered in rouge, and the crane lifting mechanism for lifting the mirror off there is still downstairs, and also the little pans that were used to collect the stuff. I don't know about the answer. Well, you, you you get the parabolic figure. Usually, you try to go for trying to get a sphere, which is easy to check with your Foucault tester because you have a uniform gray all the way across the mirror if there's no imperfections in the spherical polished mirror. But then, I was telling you about the overhang, that it takes out more out of the center than it does off the edge. So you overhang the mirror over the edge of that pitch lap and use what we call a W stroke and go all over the edge quite about one third. And then you come back across and go off on the other edge the whole time you're walking around the barrel to keep the, to keep your lap also spherical or turns parabolic actually. And then you do that for a while. It heats up the mirror. So you got to stop and check your mirror. And uh, we had to let them cool off for about a half an hour before we, we checked them, even though it was PowerX. Because we won't get the correct figure because of the heat built up in the surface of the mirror. And it would change the figure of the mirror. So we, we had to wait till it cooled off to check it. Then they started back doing the polishing grind. Uh, Edmund predicted it would take only eight hours to grind and polish a mirror, a six inch mirror. Now, if you're Sam DeLay or Bill Swafford, it probably only took about four or five hours. <laughs> Bobby, that was that was a wonderful program, and 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 Thank those you. pictures are fantastic. Yeah, that uh, believe it or not, I was rather tearful when I was doing that because you know I was friends of Arthur and Bruce, and they're no longer with us, and I. I really got acquainted with Clarence Jones because I, I met many of his friends that were still around. And and Bruce kept, kept reminding me he was a gentle, generous man. And, that's, of course, that's one reason we don't have the mirror blank and we don't have the t grinding machine and everything because he loaned everything out. <laughs> but he, uh, he Matt, he's probably something like you, you know, he burnt the candle at both ends, and it was always going. And he he drove his family nuts, literally. <laughs> and uh, that's about right. <laughs> <laughs> is that what you do? <laughs> <laughs> I know I I get a hint of it every now and then <laughs> when you're talking, to me. you know, driving me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you want me to shut up? <laughs> oh, is it time to quit? Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> We're going to give a tour of the telescope.